black rack mount case sitting when I'm talking about packets, which don't weigh very much and come out of a laptop just fine. Um, believe me, give me a chance, I'll show you something new. All right, people, my name is Dan Kaminsky. Um, this is my first time out here in Seattle. I'm out from Silicon Valley. Beautiful place you got here. Um, of course, I don't know where all the rest of you are from, so you guys may be thinking about this exact same thing. I'm here to talk to you about very strange ways to manipulate networks. Um, my philosophy is take it or leave it. What we got is pretty much what we're going to have for quite a long period of time, at least in terms of the protocols and systems that are deployed all the way throughout the internet. So if we want new functionality, and believe you me, I'm sure we want it, we're going to have to find new ways to do it. Now these ways might be a little unorthodox, and they might require looking at and tapping resources that we previously might not have been addressing. But that's the price of progress. Sometimes you have to get at least a little bit creative. So, November 2002, I released a package of tools on Unix known as the Paketo Kairetsu. Um, it's Japanese for the packet system. I named it this because it's basically a suite of only slightly interrelated network tools. They nonetheless do manage to work together and actually create some interesting proof of concept capabilities. Now I bring up proof of concept because I never actually intended any of these tools to be inherently really useful. Um, I just wanted to see what was possible with alternative approaches to using the network. It turned out that these methods were actually pretty flexible. So what's new? Um, like I've been telling people, if I ever go around and give the same talk year after year and year, somebody please put me out of my misery. Um, what's new for here? Well, let's see, this is Black Hat Windows, so this should imply, yes, all those fun Unix tools are very slowly and very painfully, but yes, they are coming to Windows. You will be able to do everything on Windows with the network that I've been doing on Unix. Um, beyond that, libpaketo. This I actually think is even more important because quite frankly, there's quite a lot of smart people in this world who don't have any desire to learn TCP IP to the insane degree that I've kind of forced myself to. Um, that being said, they have some interesting ideas for things to do. I'd like to make it easier. Um, Libpaketo is nice enough and flexible enough, there will actually be full programs on this screen. Um, needless to say, it could be extended far more with far more complexity, but you'll see. Um, and this is interesting. I have not mentioned this at all anywhere before publicly. I've been working on the perennial problem of uh, resolving the conflict between secure socket flare and intrusion detection systems. Um, both are very popular in the security world. Both annoy me quite greatly, but neither work well with each other. So one of the things I've done quite a lot of research into is what can we do about that? Um, and a lot, a lot more. We've got, what, 75 minutes here, so um, <laughs> let's get going here. And now we have the obligatory blank slide that has no reason to be here. Ah, yes, ScanRand. ScanRand is probably the most popular tool inside of Paketo. Um, it is a really, really high-speed TCP scanner. It detects TCP services, HTTP, um, Windows file sharing, and so on with extraordinarily uh, fast ability. Um, the most well-known test statistic, 65,000 addresses were scanned inside of a multinational corporate network. Um, 8,000 replies, no, that's not true. 8,000 positive replies were received quite a bit more negative replies were received. Um, this scan, this audit, took four seconds. Now this appeals to me. Um, I used to work at Cisco. I used to look at how can I figure out how do we manage large networks, and this appeals to me greatly. Um, wow, now auditing is no longer something you do every quarter, and you hope it's done in a few days or a week. It's like, huh, I wonder what's up now. And the network tells you. There's simply that much spare bandwidth on networks, and quite frankly, it really doesn't take that much resources to ping a box and tell, ask it if its web server's open. Um, this was an experiment. It was just me saying, huh, when, what would happen if I treated TCP like UDP? Holy Jesus, it's going fast. Um, well, then the goal ended up working. Um, one of the big things, though, 
is I come from a security background. So simply scanning very fast is cool, but it has problems. Namely, I don't want somebody to be able to attack me just as fast. Um, so how do I make this kind of behavior secure? First of all, how did I do it? Um, I did it statelessly. I used an architecture where I sent messages without actually keeping track of what messages I sent. Therefore, by not incurring the load of tracking my output, I was able to output messages with quite a bit more of speed versus, say, Nmap that makes sure, you know, establishes structures, watches what it's doing, makes sure it's not, you know, makes sure everyone's up and listening and ready, and it you know, takes a day or two to scan a class B, whereas ScanRan takes four seconds. Um, for 90 to 95% coverage. You run it again and you get to 98.8 you know, and so on. Um, how do you secure stateless operation? Find a mirror, recognize yourself. Anyone here do web development? All right, dealing with cookies. Dealing with a secure way of dealing with cookies. You encrypt the message, you put it on the user's machine, user comes back, they give you back the encrypted message. You decrypt it. User never has any idea what you're storing on their machine. You get the benefits of stateless operation. They get the benefits of actually being able to come back and not have to provide all this information that otherwise they'd have to type in or you would have to store. Well, HTTP is a relatively heavyweight protocol. Um, however, we can take this same attitude and we can use it on TCP, just with much, much smaller amounts of bits. So the question is, what can we find that will act like an HTTP cookie? Um, well, in technical terms, uh, TCP scans begin with a SYN packet to synchronize the connection. Um, what are the components of the reply? Whatever you get back, assuming you get anything back, what are the components you control? Well, you, you control the IP addresses. Uh, ideally, you're controlling where your message is going. And if you ever want to get anything back, you're probably going to control your source IP as well. Um, can't really manipulate either of those if you actually want to get a reply back, which you don't always, mind you. Um, source port and destination port. Ports refer to the services you're connecting to, and the destination port's pretty much fixed. You know, if you're trying to connect to the web port, you're connecting to the web port. That's it. But nobody's telling you what source port you got to use. Nobody's telling you what initial sequence number you got to use. In fact, you're told very strongly, both those things should be random. Nobody should be able to predict them. Well, the source port's two bytes and the initial sequence number's four bytes. That gives us um, 48 bits worth of reflected capacity. Now, it's not as huge as an HTTP cookie, but we can do some good stuff with it. Now, what was done in ScanRan 1.x is um, inverse SYN cookies. SYN cookie is an old, one of the methods deal, to deal with SYN floods back in about 96. I don't need to go into the technical details, but um, inverse SYN cookies is related. The idea is I send a message to somebody. And what's the important thing I want to know? If I get a message back, did I talk to them in the first place? Um, that small amount of information I can actually reasonably encode in the sequence number, in the 32-bit value. And all I do is I take all the values that I wish to lock down, the IPs in place and the ports in place, and I run them through what's called an HMAC, a hashed message authentication code, using the SHA-1 um, algorithm. Um, SHA-1 gives you 160 bits, I take 32. Now you might wonder, you know, this is terribly insecure, 32 is a lot less than 160, but keep in mind, that's, that's 32 bits per individual packet. On a large scale scan, you have tremendous numbers of packets going out. You have tremendous amounts of your actual over, a non-negligible amount of your overhead is in fact this crypto variable. Um, so yes, an attacker at you know, maximum work, basically you know, the, working to break one of the keys and you know, send you one false reply back doesn't help with any of the others. Um, so you end up actually getting this really nice expansion effect cryptographically. Um, this is what's new, because there's got to be new stuff. Um, Timestamps and the port number. We have another 16 bits left, 2 to the 16, 65,000 different things we could place in there. Um, in the 1.0 series, we just used absolute latency. Oh, yeah. Start a scan, and oh, you know, five seconds later after the guy hit enter, I got a packet. So that packet was like five seconds late. 
But what if I had bandwidth limiting on, which believe me, I had to put in pretty quickly. Um, or what if I have a persistent listener and it just gets a packet? How do I find out when this packet was sent? How do I get performance metrics? Well, one thing you can do is you have these extra 16 bits there, put it in there. Uh, with 65,000 different states, we can get one millisecond accuracy on our latency within a 65 second window. Now, if 65 seconds is insufficient, we can start manipulating the seed value that we're using to run our cryptography. So we basically take time, we make it one of the factors of the um, HMAC seed, and now what happens is, now there's, an, there's a penalty. You have to test the incoming um, signatures against you know, multiple seeds, multiple possibilities, to say, you know, is it in the 65, first 65 second window, the second, the third, the fourth, and your computation goes up, but those 32 bits that were once all entirely crypto, now they're being mixed in with the time, but it's really difficult to unmix them. So, and it, it may in fact be computationally infeasible. I haven't actually um, done the full workup on that. But um, to some degree, you can go ahead, you can share the crypto bits and actually expand your, um, range of time. But I mean, I don't know, works for me. Um, basic features that I built in the ScanRand, um, port and range parsing, so you can do nice 1.2.3 and then all the way to 4, 5 all the way to 6, 8 all the way to 50, you can use comma notation, trying to make it easy and usable for whatever network you happen to have, describe it. If you have a list of your hosts in a file, I'll read that, no problem. Um, Port aliases, a quick list, a super quick list. Every known port as ripped straight from the source code of uh, Nmap and credited, thank you. Um, yes, bandwidth limitation, many people requested that. What do I have new? Single threaded mode. Um, if you're operating on a platform that doesn't like forking much, which would be Windows. Um, yeah, I now support, it was not, it was not trivial to write, but I actually support having a single process, a single thread, and it manages both the sending of packets and the receiving. Now, the thing to understand about ScanRand is there's no actual link between the two that's necessary. All that you actually have is this cryptographic variable and a bunch of IPC that's effectively bouncing off of other people. There's no need for the sender and the receiver to have any significant awareness of each other, be in the same process space, be on the same machine. One of the nice things you can do is you can run one persistent ScanRan listener with a given seed value, and then have a hundred different senders that go off whenever each individual department wants to send. Theoretically, what you can do, and one of the reasons I wrote the API, is I want to see a MySQL backend. I want to see the receiver linked into MySQL, picking up responses from all over a corporate network, and individual departments set up senders and they basically spoof their source address. A legitimate use for spoofing. A new functionality that we get out of doing that. Excellent. Um, and it's a very simple API, as you'll see later, so it is quite feasible. So, basic demo. Um, hi, let's scan my network. So let's see, we're getting responses in you know, three milliseconds, there's another at 17, another at 21, there's two at 24. Um, yeah, this method's actually reasonably fast. Um, making it work this fast on Windows is being interesting, but it is actually working. Uh, the Windows release is happening within the next couple of days to one week, by the way, just so you know. If you need it immediately, let me know. You'll get something within 24 hours. Um, trace routing. ScanRand will also tell you not only what's on your network, but how your network is built. Um, now, as you can see, basically, it does this incredible rapidity, we're going all the way to our destination within 241 milliseconds. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there were these little values that were inside of brackets on the right side. What is it? Well, it's called an estimated hop count. It's the distance it looks like the packet came from. Now, when we were doing the trace route, no questions, no problems, we use what's known as the Van Jacobson net technique. So when we say this packet should go one hop, it's on one port number. When we say it should go another hop, it's another port number. So as their packets come back to us, we know it precisely how many hops we sent that thing to go before it died and you know, fell on its sword for us. Um, but this is different because this we can do 
for anybody who comes with us, comes to us. Most operating systems begin their time to live counter. Now I should, what's a time to live counter? Anyone here into, in bio, in a biotech person, studied bio in college? Familiar with telomeres? Telomeres are um, extensions on our genome, uh, to simplify greatly, and the idea is that every time the cell splits, a little piece comes off. And eventually, there's no more of these pieces to come off and the cell dies, the cell stops splitting. This seems to be the cause of much of human aging. Now, telomeres don't just exist inside of us, we have telomere or telomeric equivalent on our networks. Now why? Let's say you had a packet that could never die. Let's say there was a routing loop. In other words, message over there thinks the fastest route's there. Message over there thinks the, the router over there thinks the fastest route's there. And it goes back, and it goes back, and it goes all the way around. If you have no limitations on lifetimes for packets, your network eventually becomes populated with immortal packets. And the only way to stop it is to shut it down, is for everything to end. So TTL values are a service, a mandatory service, provided by every single routing device on the internet with some small exception. And usually it's explicit and intentional. What's interesting is TTL values have to start somewhere. Now, they start from a program. Programs are written by programmers. Programmers are humans, interesting humans, who really like powers of two. So, um, hang on one second. Yes, beautiful. So programmers like powers of two. So most TTL values begin at 32, 64, 128, or 255, which is one less than 256. Um, if you assume that a TTL value starts there, you get a packet with a TTL of 59. Uh-huh, probably started at 64. 64 minus 59, that packet probably traveled five hops. And if you actually look at the evidence of what you see when you do trace routes that are absolutely for sure, you're usually within one or two hops. Now this has some really interesting and unexpected uses. Now let's take a look at, and you have no idea how great your timing was with the laser. Let's look over here. We have a little bit of a desync going on. I'm scanning my own machine, I'm docsparrow.com, and I scan my machine and my web port's up, and my um, uh, FTP server's down, and this, uh, the SSL's up, and this is down, but look at that, look at all those 22s. But it's 11 hops away, why am I seeing all these 22s? And why is this down port 12? Everyone, I'd like to introduce you to my PIX firewall, who in its absolute joy of rejecting my packet, forgot to reset the TTL counter. Now if you look at that, 22 is twice 11. The packet went all the way there, TTL decrementing, and it got bounced immediately as fast as possible, 11 hops back. Guess what? That one didn't do that. That one got all the way to my Linux machine. So by observing TTLs, we're able to detect firewalls that uh, basically query their rule set. Act or reset analysis. This is another example where now we go ahead, we send a totally bogus packet. We send an acknowledgement on a stream this server has no idea. When we send an acknowledgement, we have to have a sequence number. Well, as long as we're gonna have a sequence number, we might as well put a little signature in it so that nobody can fake it. Um, so we go ahead and we send this ACK out and it goes there and you can actually read from the flags that it's an ACK, although it's just a number in here. Now look at the TTL. The TTL is 216. When we get the reply back, the TTL is 189. Now there's nothing close to 189. The range from about 129 to something like 216 never shows up in almost any legitimate traffic on the internet. Which means if you get a packet back inside that range, you probably caused it by sending one of these with a TTL of 216. Sent 216, got back 189, divide by two and you have pretty much the average hop count. Turns out this is actually a surprisingly accurate way of getting distances, even when certain firewalls are trying to give you a forced look at how far away various hosts are. It's very strange. Email hijacker detection. 
yeah, this was about an hour ago, actually. So I'm testing ScanRAN, and I go ahead and I look, and I'm like, huh, that's odd. My mail server seems to have teleported 15 hops closer to me. <laughs> what? So I'm very confused, and I go ahead and I connect to like any mail server I can find, and I'm like, wow, this, this ArgoSoft company must be really happy, because the entire internet, including Microsoft, that had that little exchange product, my god, the entire internet loves Argosoft. Yeah, someone had gone ahead and hijacked uh, all outgoing mail traffic. So if you send mail through SMTP, someone read it. Now I could just stop there, but you know, who is this guy? Well, let's see. Um, first of all, let's go ahead and try to actually trace. All I the only access I have to this guy is that if I go anywhere on the internet, on port 25, it's going to go to him. Well, let's see what happens if I try to run traces. Well, I have this first hop, the uh, router that we're running. And then over here, we have four hops away. So, so it claims, but is that accurate? Well, it turns out I don't have the slide up, but it is. If you send one with a TTL of two, doesn't get there. TTL of three, nothing. TTL of four, suddenly this guy's talking. So guess what, the guy's four hops away. Well, where is he four hops away? Well, it turns out this hotel's network is a little bit odd. And you need to go about five or six hops before you even get out of here. So um, my best guess is that he's on this network, the one that we know factually is four hops away. And if you look at the latencies, well, this one's at about 49 milliseconds to get a response. And over here, we're at about 44, 45. It's possible he's got some tunnel to the outside world, but the latencies seem to match up. So, you know, I, well, let's leave that alone. You know, I'm here to give a talk about some stuff here. Um, let's go back. Okay, so TCP. What does TCP do as opposed to, you know, you know, throwing some candy on the floor? Well, you see, if that was TCP, that candy would come back up. Maybe a new one would form or something. Um, TCP fixes stuff. TCP has an implementation of hello. <laughs> you know, you pick up the phone, no one's there, you're like, hello, hello, anyone there? Bueller? Um, now, TCP specifies you've got to do that. But how? How many hellos do you have to give before it's a hello? And um, how long in between them? How long is that wait? Now, you have to say hello a couple times, but it never says how many times. It's different from operating system to operating system. And any time you hear it's different from operating system to operating system, you just need to have this knee-jerk reaction, fingerprint, because that's how it works. Different, fingerprint. Little stupid thing that doesn't matter, fingerprint. Your finger, fingerprint. I mean, that's how it is. Now, I didn't find this myself. I refuse to take credit. This is by Frank Vaset. He's out in France, brilliant guy. Um, they wrote a tool called Ring, made it a patch to Nmap. Um, very good, very good work. Little bit difficult to get working, but very good work. Um, I decided to see if I could somehow cajole ScanRand into doing this. Now, Ring goes ahead and actually tests that hellos in all sorts of different phases inside of TCP. Well, yeah, I don't support that yet, and it's kind of scary once I do. But um, I do support sending a SYN, and when I get the SYN act back, well, right now I don't do anything. My kernel does a really nice thing for me. It sees this SYN act come back, this, yes, let's talk, or, you know, I'm ready to talk to you. My kernel's like, I didn't talk to this guy. Reset, go away, I don't want to talk to you. And this is great for me, because now I don't have all these guys saying, you, you called me, you sent me a message. You know, I get to scan all these machines, my kernel's doing great useful service for me. It's great, except here, because for, this, for this fingerprinting thing, for this method where I go ahead and I track people and see how many hellos they say, I want the kernel to shut up because I want to hear how many times they say hello. Now, Ring, the reason why Ring's a pain to use is it deals with your firewall and your kernel. It's very kernel specific. Yeah, um, how about I just use a different IP on my subnet? Um, kernel doesn't know it's supposed to be listening on that. But there's a problem. Now, layer three, I can send a message out on a different IP. But at layer two, there needs to be a MAC address that's listening, that's going to say, yes, if you send me these packets, I will handle them. I will be happy. Now, I could have written this for ScanRand. But to be honest, I wrote this on a dare at 11.30 in the morning in the middle of a Baltimore hotel. So I said, hey, wait a second. This kernel, you know, we have our goods, we have our badge. But guess what? 
I'm going to go ahead and tell my kernel, hey, if you ever hear anyone on the network ask for this IP, just give your own MAC address. Don't do anything past that, just give it out. And it turns out you can do this. It's a feature called proxy ARP that's been used for years. Um, not used like this, but used for years. So we go ahead, and this actually this works on Windows. I'm, I'm sorry that all the screenshots are, are Unix, but really, this does work on Windows. Um, you can proxy ARP. You set your, um, this is the MAC address of the machine. We uh, add this IP. And now if you look, suddenly we're getting all these responses back, these extra responses. It's no longer just stopping on the first one. Well, here's a plus three and plus six. So zero seconds to three seconds, and we got another one at nine. Here's a zero, threes, and here's a six. But look at this machine. I get one at you know, four seconds later, another one six seconds later, another one 12 seconds later. 46 seconds after my initial packet, this schmuck's still sending me packets. Yeah, that's Linux. Everyone else is Windows. <laughs> now keep in mind, I didn't send anything strange. No bizarre packets, no strange tricks. I just sent a normal sin and shut the heck up and let the other guy do all the work. Speaking of the other guy, um, well, actually, that's supposed to be pasted, but I did it to our friend, uh, the email hijacker. Um, he has a very strange fingerprint, whoever he is. He responds almost immediately. He responds three seconds later, and he's gone. No, no plus six, no plus four plus six. So someday I will find the operating system that responds only once, three seconds later, and be like, aha, that was the incredibly rare email hijacker. So. Yeah, go away. So what about this trace routing? Um, why does trace route work so well? Now remember how I said we had 48 bits for TCP? Well, trace route depends on ICMP errors. ICMP errors are big. ICMP errors are really big. The operating system just tosses them out. But you don't just get back like the 48 bits from TCP. You get every single bit of the IP header, including any options, I believe, Plus, it'll go ahead and give you eight bytes of TCP. That's 64 bytes of TCP. I mean, that's 64 bits of TCP. Everything in IP, you're in reflection heaven. You can just operate statelessly beyond your wildest dreams. Now, most OSs just drop all these resources, but we're trying to find new stuff to play with, so we don't drop it. What stunts can we pull? Well, um, one thing we can pull is this thing called parasitic trace route. We can run a trace route over an established TCP session. I mean, think about it. Everything I described about trace routes, you know, the, you set the number of hops, and you go by one and two, whatever. Well, that's all layer three. That's all IP. Well, TCP is layer four. It, not only is TCP layer four, it handles errors. If it gets the same packet 20 times, it's like, dude, I got the same packet 20 times. I'm only going to care about it once. So someone can send me a packet, you know, as part of an established official TCP stream that all the firewalls in the world love, and I'm like, great, I'm going to send you back 20 replies to this packet you sent me, each one with a different time to live, and for a couple firewalls, it's going to poke all the way back through. Now, this isn't why I made this. I made this because routing is getting really, really weird. Remember what I was showing with the email hijacker, where you know port 25 and only port 25 was redirected off yonder? Well, that's happening quite a bit with policy routing and a couple of some of the other really strange routing hacks that, well, I'm working on and will hopefully someday deploy. Um, I would like to know the route. Why is this one connection broken? What's going on over this one? Not some new one that I spawned. Why is this shredded? Parasitic trace route lets me do it. The next time a packet comes over that link, I go ahead and I send a trace back out and I see, where did this come from? What is going on? How can I track it back? Um, I'm sure there's some people who do you know, shoot back and strike back who love this. Not my department. Other potential uses. Um, anyone here doing peer-to-peer -peer networks? Lots of hosts talking to lots of other hosts by any chance? Excellent. Good man. Um, yeah, so you have like 20 or 30 machines. You have them all send packets to each other with a known TTL. Geez, now you know hop differences between all of them, and when you're designing your great, efficient, wonderful um, mesh that tries to minimize network bandwidth, not only do you have latency to play with, now you have hop count. Now you know how many networks you're moving over. And because you control the protocol, you can put in the greatest timestamps, although TCP timestamps do exist, and they're quite nice when they're supported. 
You can put in timestamps. You know you're a beginning TTL. In fact, I even believe, especially on Windows, there's a set sock off. Set sock off IP TTL. They built it for the multicast people because for IP multicast, you really, really need to be able to control your TTL value. And it works for unicast too. You know, there's just some guy who's just like, I don't know, maybe someday one wants to make a web server that'll only work for three hops. Well, A, you can, and B, now you can really start optimizing your peer-to-peer -peer tools. So go ahead, have fun. Let me know if you get something cool going there. Lib Paquetto. Hi, speaking of getting something cool going, yeah, get some stuff cool going, because there's, you know, there's what I can write, and then there's this huge amount you guys can, and that's cool. Um, Lib is really easy. Um, yeah, this compiles on Windows. Compiles, perfect, great. Maybe not BC++, but it compiles. Um, yeah, um, that runs. You compile that, you run it, it will scan that IP on port 80 and port 22. If you put in argv0, you can put in your commands on the command line. Look just like a normal scan. Little problem though, um, you know, options would be nice. It would be nice to be able to configure your scan to do certain things. So yes, we've got to make, I got, you know, structure of the day, nice little configuration structure. Build it, set your verbosity up, set your bandwidth to what you want, put the conf in the scan rand line, and hey, now you can go ahead and control it a bit. You want to have your own external interfaces for controlling that structure? Go ahead, works fine. Another API demo. Yeah, you know, my, my reporting stuff's cool. Prints out, but like, you know, sooner or later, sometime in computer history, made, they made this thing called the GUI. Um, you might want to like spawn a window or, you know, do something crazy like that, yeah. Um, I will call your function every time I receive a packet, not just the packet, because that's easy, that's part of PCAP. I will call your function every time I receive a packet that matches the TCP stamp, that matches the inverse sin cookie. So you're only gonna get packets that are good. Now if you want packets that are not good, that's fine, there's a callback inside of the uh, conf structure, you set it to null, now you're getting all the packets. You can do your own work, trying not to be in your way here. Um, so hey, jump for joy. <laughs> Every time this program runs, it's going to say, hey, we got an X byte packet. Um, isn't that great? Well, no, you kind of want to know what's in that packet. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so I built what's called PK parse layers. PK parse layers takes a packet, takes a frame struct, and it basically gives you the libnet pointer headers, say, hey, I don't, Without, without copying in place, you're able to modify the packet that came into your network, came into your network interface. In fact, if you want to take it, parse it, modify it, and spit it back out, hopefully reset the TTL. I say this because you know, I, I forgot to do that in my own little NAT implementation. Um, that works great. So if you look over here, hey, we got an uh, you know, I byte packet from this address, from an S, inet n2a, Hey look, X, IP, I can refer to the IP source directly. Don't have to, you, I'm trying to prevent it so you guys should not have to redo the work I did. Mind you, there's all these really ugly attacks where you set your lengths off and you know, do buffer overflows. Doing my part, preventing buffer overflows. Let's say you want to do a little more. Um, let's say that trace route stuff really grabs you. You love ICMP, it's like the meaning of your life. You want to go and not only parse the packet that comes in, but you heard about that you parsed the ICMP sub packet that came in. Yes, you can. Declare a frame, an X, and an IC. Parse it. And say, hey, wait, look. This thing's an ICMP packet. I have a valid ICMP pointer. Parse it. Parse it from the X frame into the IC frame. Hey, and now you have the ability to make references to IC. Um, IC, is that ICT? No, it's XTCP. One of those is supposed to be ICTCP. Oh yeah, here we are. So okay, so let's say it's an ICMP packet. Tracing to this host stopped at here. So we look at this value. These, the X and the IC are swapped. But basically, you can make a reference to the values inside of the ICMP subheader. And I'll have a better demo up on the uh, Stalinistic revised version of this slide. So isn't that nice? Isn't that fun? You know, crazy TTL stuff. But if you hear another word about it, your head's probably going to explode. I'm with you. I've been talking about it up here in front of all of you. So let's move on to something else, something completely random. Totally random, actually. It's called Fentropy. Um, I'm not sure how much a lot of you know about this. 
But particularly for cryptography, it's really, really important to have a good source of random numbers. Um, now, some people go ahead and you know, take a look and see if they can see it. No. Um, some people run these statistical tests. And the statistical tests are great, but at the end of the day, it's just more numbers. And you know what? When people really, really want something to be secure, they'll look at numbers and say, it's just more numbers. It's really easy to do. They all look the same. There's only 10 of them. So um, yeah, people just ignore the numbers. But visualization's hard to ignore. There's a whole one third of our brain devoted to it, so it's really convincing. Eyewitness testimony and all that stuff. Um, so if you're trying to go ahead, A, you know, see for yourself that something's random, and B, you're trying to prove to someone else that something isn't, it'd be nice if you can go ahead and really show it. Um, now you might be wondering, remember this whole huge machine here? Um, I found some really cool software to do this with, based off the work done by Michael Zalewis, Zalewis, Zalewski, about these really weird mathematical constructs called strange attractors. Open qubits. Raise your hand if you happen to know what a volumetric renderer is. All right, you seen MRIs where they like take a MRI, they reconstruct what the bone looks like or what the organs look like. Those are volumetric renders. Those things take a lot of data and try to simplify it down to basically what would this person look like if they didn't have, you know, their skin? What would they look like? takes a tremendous amount of work. These things are incredibly expensive. And then this grad student's like, huh, these video game, these computers are becoming like video game hardware. With all this programmability and optimization and huge amounts of bandwidth, I wonder if I could use the video game hardware to render the human body. And yeah, yeah, we're talking like orders of magnitude improvements. So this is why we got this thing. So, I was going to go ahead, I was going to have, hold on, give me this, and, did I just close? No, good. So I was going to go ahead and have this thing all nice, you know, you pop up and then be this big surprise, like, oh my god, there's a head, and it's floating, and now it's dead. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the computer crashed, and this thing was running late, so now you're going to have to watch this thing boot. Um, this is OpenCubus. It actually is written using the QT framework, and is probably the single most impressive thing ever written in the QT framework. Um, why don't I show you actually this thing used in its native form? Just, you know, the, uh, just so you guys get a feel for, no, this is really revolutionary stuff. Okay, I'll set it to the really fast mode, because hey, hey, check it out. <laughs> yeah, this software is insane. Um, it's not just that it's insane, it's that it's really, really, really easy to program for. Um, Believe me, this actually directly relates to the work I'm doing, so there's a reason. But check that out. This usually requires like $20,000 hardware. This software, for programmers out there, if you can write a matrix to a disk, you know, like an array of three dimensions, you win. <laughs> you just stream it. There's no funky file format. You win. You get to talk to OpenQubit. Very nice. And this appeals to me because I wanted to see what would happen if I took Zalewski stuff and I ran it through open qubits. So let's find out. Oh, and we have to switch modes. For some reason it always defaults to the wrong one. Um, hang on. Now let's say, for some strange reason, you thought, huh, why don't I take the NT kernel? And why don't I treat that as my source of random numbers? Well, very bad things would happen, assuming this thing loads. So, hang on. What you'll notice is that there are regions of clustering in there. There's areas where there's higher density, where you can see the form, the structure. Now, OpenCubis has no idea. Ventropy has no idea this is any kind of piece of software. But it happens to run it through this very odd and very unexpectedly powerful algorithm, and now it's undeniable. There's structure to this. Now, if you look at a photograph, it's even more undeniable. And actually, all the photographs that I've found end up looking a little different. But look at this. Ends up being, I'm pretty sure, the... Um, 
the different colors in the thing. So what's really nice about this, you know, thinking out of the box, it's a very nice way of taking arbitrary data. I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's on your network, I don't care if it's the time in between packets coming in. If it has structure to it, not always, but often you're able to see it and it's really, really undeniable. It also looks really cool and is a hell of a lot nicer than, hey look, more TTL hacks. <laughs> so I thought you guys would like that. Even if it did require me lugging this sucker around. All right, so um, you know, 1.x, all cube is. 2.x, I've gotten a patch for Pauvre for people who don't have like 1.5 gigahertz machines with you know, GeForce 3s. Um, Pauvre, lot slower, lot, lot, lot cheaper. <laughs> um, someday, someday Maya, Maya and I will have a little fun. Maya is a very, very popular 3D rendering toolkit. So, um, we don't need to go through the Bug me later if you actually want to know the math of why this works. It's actually pretty interesting. And when you cut through all the strange attractor stuff, it's calculus. All right. SSL versus IDS is one of the last things I got to talk to you about. The eternal conflict. Well, first of all, these both annoy the hell out of me. Um, SSL, if you lose your certificate today, um, that's great. All your traffic from a year ago is now decryptable. Like if someone was sniffing, they win. It's not just that, all your traffic a year from now. Also completely wide open. Um, SSL has the worst failure case of any link style protocol that I've ever seen. I mean, it's equivalent to PGP, but PGP doesn't have the advantage of having the other guy on the phone with it. Um, it's really bad and really, really problematic. Um, but let's ignore that. IDS, IDS also annoys me. Why? It's so we're under attack and world's falling. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, whatever. And here's your salary. The world's under attack. Yeah, whatever. No one ever does anything. <laughs> so you're spending all this money and you're not doing anything. I don't get it. Um, but let's say I can ignore that. Because what annoys me even more, I know I resp my, my roommate works deep in IDS. I respect those who have faith in it. They do some great work in both IDS and SSL. The conflict between the two, the fact that two of the great pillars of security can't really work together. This bothers me. Now, what do I mean they can't work together? Now, IDS systems monitor IDS systems. IDS monitors the network traffic between the trusted domain, your servers, and the untrusted domain, the unwashed masses of the internet, watching and waiting for attacks and doing nothing about them. SSL encrypts the network traffic between the trusted and the untrusted, blinds everyone who's watching, everyone on the internet who might be spying, also blinds the IDS system. So you can't have both. You kind of have this choice. You, you either suppress the passive attacks using SSL, and you suffer all the active attacks of all the web hackers who are like, hey, this guy's listening on 443. Guess where all my web attack scripts are going? 443, ho. Um, or you suppress all the active attacks, and now you're suffering passive. You're suffering um, all the people who might be theoretically intercepting communications, listening to passwords, all that kind of identity theft nastiness. It's not good. <laughs> it's really problematic. So I wanted to see, is there something that we can do to get past this? Um, well, so I started auditing SSL. I wanted to really know. Now, my history is I really, really know SSH. Um, my first talk at Black Hat was about SSH. Alternate problem, alternate solution space, but I knew SSH very well. I didn't know SSL that well. They were only one letter off, so I figured I better learn the other one. Um, well, like both PKI system, SSL uses asymmetric crypto, securely transmits a small amount of data for symmetric crypto systems. Why not do everything with asymmetric? Because RSA is really dog and slow. It's terrible. But all you need to do is just move this little tiny key and you know, let triple, even triple deaths is orders of magnitude faster. And let alone RC4. RC4 is not even worth getting an accelerator CPUs are so good at it. Um, well, yes, SSL moves a little bit amount of data. But it's not the minimum. It's not the tiniest. It moves what's called a master secret. It's this batch of data. Um, and this batch of data is segmented into six, no less than four, possibly up to six independent cryptographic entities. Now, if you look at the books, incidentally, um, I don't know this guy. This book is absolutely the book to get if you need to know about SSL. It's called SSL and TLS by Eric Rascola. Um, it's great. Um, 
The negotiator, okay, so he says it's very, very bad if the master secret gets compromised. All is lost. No, 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 all is lost if your certificate's compromised. The master secret gets compromised, one session's toast. But what if you just compromised a little bit of the master secret? Not even compromised, what if you just sent small pieces of it? Well, the master secret serves six keys. Two of them handle the encryption from the client to the server and vice versa. That's the ability to read traffic. Two of them handle authentication from the client to server. That is the ability to write traffic. If you have something with triple death and cipher blockchaining mode, you have two more. They're called initialization vectors. And what initialization vectors basically are is you may begin reading now. Now usually now equals the beginning of the communication, but what if it doesn't? What if it equals after the passwords have been exchanged? In fact, what if the only keys you share are, at, are only the direction from the client to the server? SSL lets you do this because it has independent keys in each direction. And guess what? You only need to share the read key. You don't need to share the authentication key. The IDS can impute whether traffic's good or bad based off of whether you as the server are rejecting these packets you're getting from the outside world. Yes, this is, I'm, I'm assuming that there's none of these uh, TCP attacks where you get traffic all the way there and then it silently drops, but the IDS is out of sync. I'm ignoring that for the moment. IDSs need to deal with this no matter what. Now, these keys that I'm talking about, they're totally independent. You can give some of them away and not others. You can give them away to a few people and you give them away on a session, per session basis. Your bank, all you do is you give the client to server key away over an encrypted tunnel, which is now, you know, you did one exchange and now you have a way of passing back keys to your IDS system. The IDS system reads all the incoming traffic in one direction, not the other one, though it authenticates TCP and whatnot, reads all the traffic coming in. Maybe it doesn't even just read it, maybe it intercepts, evaluates if this particular attack should come in. Now you're able to resolve whatever IDSs can do good with whatever SSL can do good, and everyone's happy. You get the benefits of both. Um, Yes, and that's a very big thing. An IDS does not need to do RSA. It just needs to go ahead and get the symmetric keys for an individual session. Now, um, I did think, you know, there are other ways of doing this. One way, which is actually supported by a few intrusion detection systems, is to transfer a copy of the certificate to the IDS. This violates the first law in cryptography of private keys. Thou shalt not transport thy private key. It will get lost, it will get taken, it will get stolen. Because that's what private keys do, they put out this huge beacon. I'm lying, but I'd like you to believe that. <laughs> um, seriously, um, in a well-designed crypto system, you never need to move the private keys. You generate a private key, you move public elements, and the public elements get it trusted, and the key, private pieces that you never want to get compromised because an SSL is so horrifyingly bad, the private pieces never move. And indeed, most people don't use a certificate transfer architecture. Also because it forces your intrusion detection system to do all the RSA work. Um, SSL dump is a great tool, also written by Rascola, um, for going ahead and doing all the RSA given the certificate, picks it up, gives all the data, tremendous CPU load if you tried to use this on your IDS. Now IDSs aren't exactly bursting at the seams with spare cycles. So um, this isn't particularly the most feasible way to do things. What's much more realistic, but does demand a certain architecture, is where your actual web servers have no idea about cryptography. There's a layer in front of them, there's a set of servers, and these servers go ahead and handle all the SSL. And they do HTTP rewriting, and they go ahead and HTML rewriting, and they go ahead and they pass back HTTP into the servers, HTTP from the servers, HTTPS out onto the internet common, it's done quite a bit, um, what you'd have to do is you'd have to stick an intrusion detection system in line in between your you know, nice redundantly set up set of, uh, of SSL servers, in line now you have IDS and then you have your server farm. Well hey, you know, now you have another layer of failure, first of all. Um, second of all, uh, there's issues with HTTP rewriting. And finally, it, it just doesn't seem very kosher to me to put plain text on the wire. Even if it's only in your data center, somebody breaks into one of your machines, one of the machines on the cluster, and they run TCP dump. 
or you know, you're on a switch, big deal. There's 83 ways to get, snip, get all the traffic on a switch routed to you. So they pick up all your traffic. And you thought you were being secure, so you're just spewing everything out. This is why you can't do this in banks, and probably for the healthcare field, you can't do it in the HIPAA scene either. This one ain't bad. I haven't heard of this being used, and I gotta say, it actually is a good idea. Um, it's really easy to write, which is why I think it's a good idea. The idea is your web applications send a message to the IDS. They say, hey, I got this message from the web server. Not a packet, not socket, I got this message. Should I serve it, or should I think it's an attack? Now, optionally, you can have a, should I respond to it, where it means you have a latency. Takes bandwidth every time a packet comes in, another packet goes out. But that can be managed by using multiple interface cards, or just gig E, where you have gobs of free bandwidth. Um, but it doesn't require interfacing with the crypto engine. It doesn't even require interfacing with the web server. You've got web applications, it just sends its request, nicely packaged, hey, is this good, yes or no? You don't have to worry about any of the TCP tricks that guys like me come up with. Um, you can be even more selective. Instead of just the um, IV crypto trick of, um, oh yeah, after this point, I'm gonna give you the initialization vector. Aha, now you didn't get the password. Now it's just like, yeah, that's the password. IDS, you don't need to know that to tell me if that's a virus. So, um, yeah. Plain text forwarding is a very viable alternative to what I'm discussing at the crypto layer. Um, this is the kind of thing you go home and build today if you wanted to resolve the conflict between SSL and IDS. Now, if you do that, when I say plain text forwarding, I don't mean you take plain text and put it on the wire. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what you do is you go ahead and you have like an SSH tunnel or even an SSL tunnel that's persistent in between your web application server or your SSL server or your web server, whatnot, and the IDS. It's basically, here's a stream of sense potentially sensitive material from the outside world that I'd like to make sure isn't gonna kill me. Reasonable. The IDS says yes, the IDS says no. So, um, that's what I've got to do. That's what I've been dealing with. Um, question time. Uh, if I can give, ask you one thing, what do you guys want? Um, I'm always looking for interesting things to play with. So what problems have you been seeing? What can I do to help? And um, what are you completely tired of? What has been pushed to its limit and you'd rather see other work be done? Anyone have a question for me? Why don't you come up so that it'll actually hit the mic? Because I can barely hear you, and I'm over here. All right. I'm unsure what you mean by active response. You're saying you don't like the fact that the IDS in this circumstance is sending packets and therefore... Oh, oh, that's <laughs> big thing there, optional. I mean, what is the presumption of an IDS? The presumption of an IDS is you have a large number of servers and they're very good at what they do, but they can't be trusted to receive a bad packet and not get hacked. Now, if you have that presumption, then you have to say, well, wait, I go ahead, I detect this is an attack. Now, A, I could let it go through and do a bunch of damage and wake up the person at four in the morning, or B, I can do something about it. There are, and it's, it's the legitimacy game. Is this packet potentially legitimate enough for me to risk sending it onto this server? Or is it so likely to be illegitimate? For example, IP filter on uh, OpenBSD, it'll drop short fragments of like four bytes. Why? Because there's a 99.99% .99 chance it's someone trying to escape an IDS and a 0.0001 chance that somebody's on this incredibly broken network. So, I mean, it's a balancing act. It's how do you want to spend your time as an administrator? Now, between you and me, I really am not a huge fan of IDS systems at all. I don't like what I've seen come out of them, but 
I respect this is how some people choose to secure their networks, and I think this is a, occasionally a viable model for doing so. Anyone else? Go ahead. Solution to securing, securing what? Securing the web? Securing e-commerce? I mean, there's... Well, e-commerce is a whole other answer It's more or less securing the traffic that's on the wire. Securing the traffic? It doesn't matter whether it's the e-commerce site or anything else. We're all looking at what's the bottom line of the wire. Well, I've got a couple friends who are really big on anonymity. Really big. They, they you know, stone me for what I'm about to say. But I think we're coming to a point in time where I think we can accept you know what, every server is vulnerable. Every complex process is vulnerable to something. I mean, it's really tragic. Like, you'll see, you know, penetration testers will come in and they'll break in, and six months later, they'll go, okay, we did all this work. Can you break in? The answer is yes. And six months later, do all this work. Can you break in? And the answer is yes. Repeat until money is exhausted, okay? <laughs> so, I think the concept of really trying to lock down absolutely everything, and this is an utterly heretical thing to say, but the concept of trying to lock absolutely everything down doesn't seem to be working. Now what has worked? What has worked is having a really well done authentication layer. A layer where you have a small number of things you can try, a small number of spaces for the pachinko balls to fall into, where you try to go, where before somebody gets to make any requests at all, they have to lock down and assume responsibility for their actions, for their packets, and so on. This has trouble in certain environments, has trouble with Trojan horses in particular, but it's what, it's the, the most effective systems have been. So, I mean, I would personally like to see better authentication systems. HTTP basic authentication over SSL is a joke. Client-side certificate authentication for SSL has been an utter failure. You know, these, these are the kind of things that just, you know, I'm going to have enemies 10 years from now for saying. But seriously, nobody uses them. Nobody's going to use client-side certificates because they're impossible to manage. So the other half of the solution has to be about managing the problem and having realistic but effective solutions. Token has to be very specific. The tokens where it's a, where there's a special reader to them, I don't have huge amounts of faith in. Because now you have two things someone has to have. They have to be somewhere where there's a reader, and there has to be somewhere where they can get it read. I mean, that's that the thing to get read. The secure IDs, they ain't bad. Um, as much as people have, you know, whispered about the algorithm can be broken, they honestly aren't. Um, the annoyance factor is pretty high, though. Um, for very secure, for, for particularly for anything life critical, but even beyond life critical, for, for things that have large financial risk, for example, the America Online user database with 32 million credit card numbers and whatnot, yes, Secure ID is probably one of the best systems because you now have really strong authentication where it's really hard to lose. I mean, not hard to lose, but I mean, it's hard to fake, it ties to the person well, people are used to carrying around small little things with them. It does have a little bit of the feel of having a dongle, you know, like um, you have dongles on software, now you yourself are wearing a dongle. That's a bit annoying. But, um, oh, there's uh, some interesting work going on with zero authentication work systems, where say it's part of your watch, or it's part of a ring, or it's just the RFIDs on badges, only they have longer range. Um, the RFIDs have big problems because now someone can go around and say, hey, look, you're an employee of Cisco. You probably have some money. Let's take it. Um, so that's the other thing. You have to worry about you know, side effects, negative effects of authentication. But... Go ahead. Retinal eye scans specifically, no. Because um, people get really bent out of shape when they lose their vision. And not even that they do lose their vision, but that, that there's a risk. Even if it's really small. It's one of those things, this incredibly tiny risk is irrelevant. Because it just takes one person theoretically getting hurt a bit and the entire industry dies. 
Things where entire industry dies if there's a disaster are not what I want to put my you know, business's money in. Um, unless it's just an incredible amount of money that I'm making from it, which is the airline scene. Um, who said that? Oh, go ahead. Irises are faster and better. I've seen really good, in, I've seen interesting work with people walking up to um, ATMs and it just recognizes them. Um, there are problems. Your iris does change, particularly after traumatic experiences. People are not getting recognized. I've, I've used them. I was at a conference once and it's really weird. It's like a telephone. It has this m mirror on it. You see your own eye reflected in it. It's like this big. It's actually kind of creepy. Um, pro they, they're, the, the viability of them is getting better as uh, CCDs get better. I just went to a trade show. They had 1280 by 1024 digital cameras that took photos at 30 frames a second. This is tremendous. Um, now, I don't know how many effective pixels you require to do an iris authentication, but we will probably get to the point where at the level that human, at the distance humans can authenticate each other is really the distance you want machines to be able to authenticate humans in certain contexts, at least. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, was I? Uh, hello, Mr. Yamaguchi. <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, there there will o there will always be legitimate reasons to, quite frankly, not want to be registered. The negative effects of global authentication are very often underlooked. Um, I want to authenticate myself to you. I don't necessarily want you to force me to authenticate myself to you. But then there are entire systems where like, that's the point. I walk in here, you already see my face, you already hear my voice, you already recognize me. This creates significant constraints on the behavior that I can do. I don't think about those constraints, but. Well, it's easier for me to wipe my cookies than for me to take off my face. Uh, that would hurt <laughs> versus, you know, RM. <laughs> Still, there. If you want to but I have an easier ability to refuse. I can refuse to support cookies. I can even say there's no legitimate reason for you to need to get a cookie. Whereas it's hard for me to say there's no legitimate reason for you, need, to, you to need to see my face when I walk into a store. Um, in fact, social constraints go ahead and make it so that if you walk into a store with a, uh, with a mask on, people think you're you know, <laughs> a little bit of a bad person. And uh, frankly, they may be right. It's the 99.8% rule. Um, a lot of it's fuzzy. Um, well, I think I'll just end it here. I'll you know, make room for the next speaker. Guys, come up to me after. Let me know if you have any thoughts, ideas, hopes, dreams, uh, messages from anyone. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Oh, um, sorry to cut off applause, you know, it makes the ego go happy, but I have something for you guys. If, and I, I know this is not precisely the crowd that is into this, does anyone here use Sigwin? Use OpenSSH on Sigwin? Um, yeah, so I have a guide to like all sorts of interesting SSH stuff to do. And it's um, based off this book I had some work to do with, uh, Hack Proofing Your Network 2nd Edition. But these are all free, come on in, you got like people on the Unix side, be like, hey, you know. This strange guy at a Windows conference gave me a bunch of tips. <laughs> Incidentally, um, if you are running Sigwin on your laptop right now and you're not running RxVT, find me. Let me fix your install. <laughs> it's very broken without RxVT.